This meeting is being recorded. So, um, thanks for thanks for coming. Um, my name is Eric Robinson. If we haven't met, um, I'm the scholarly communications librarian for the University of St. Augustine. Um, my primary responsibility is managing um, the library's archive uh, of faculty and student research called SOAR at USA. Um, I also educate students and faculty on copyright, publication, um, assist faculty in finding venues, publication venues for their research and that kind of thing. So um, this week is peer review week, sort of nationally declared or I guess worldwide declared at this point. Um, so we, I thought I'd do a, a quick overview of kind of critiques of, of, cur of the current um, kind of standard peer review, uh, look really closely at that from a critical perspective, and um, give some insight and an overview of the open peer review methods that, that are being employed. Um, There's certainly plenty to be said about, about blind review as, as, a, as a standard, um, but there are many criticisms, and by opening the process up to some extent, um, we can meet some of those some of those critiques and also bring up some others that um, sort of win some lose some but at least we can get a, a overview of the current state of things why won't it let me go through my thing so i'm, I'm just going to go through a um, quick overview at the beginning and then we'll look really closely at some of the criticisms um, we'll talk about the different ways that peer review can be opened up um, and look at some other examples of how it's being done um, in addition to just a couple of, of things that I think are, are key elements in that process, um, particularly the Publons organization and the ORCID um, scholarly ID organization. So um, just to look at the, what, we're, what we're all very familiar with uh, about double blind peer review being that gold standard, um, everybody believes that that peer review improves quality. Well, maybe not everybody. You can see this survey, about 10% apparently didn't believe that it improves quality. Um, but the, the massive majority think that it does improve quality and it's essential to um, appropriately controlling what gets published. Um, when we look closely at, the, at these critiques, so we'll sort of define um, the purpose of peer review and see that Open peer review might meet some of the critiques, but not really suffer terribly um, from, from some of those costs of opening things up. Uh, obviously, the big double blind um, motivation is uh, the objectivity and, and the, the need for, for that ob objective critique um, and the limitation of any bias that might be introduced by knowing who the who the individual is that's doing the, that's writing the paper or the individual that's doing the review. Um, but we'll see some other biases and some other problems with that, even within the double blind system. Um, so like I said, double blind is certainly seen as the gold standard. Um, but if there, if we're looking at the, the true purpose of it, um, that objectivity in there is certainly an important part, but it, it's not really, what many at least would consider the essential purposes of peer review, um, that those purposes being technical evaluation, you know, is the, the method and the argumentation sound? Um, is this, does this study have what it takes to merit truth value? Um, is it a worthy contribution? Is it, you know, on the cutting edge or is it valuable in some other way? And certainly um, editing and improvement of the communication in the manuscript. Um, so most people would agree that those are at least at the top of the list of the purposes of peer review. Um, and those don't necessarily require anything like double blind. So if we keep that in the back of our mind as we're considering the possibilities of these other options, um, then we can see a more realistic evaluation of how necessary double blind as a standard is. So the traditional critiques of double blind review or single blind review, either one, um, boil down to a handful of things, but we can, we'll go into more detail on each one of those and how they might be met in other ways. Um, but certainly the, the bias, um, the, it's meant 
double blind review is really meant to instill objectivity and reduce those biases. Um, but we'll see that there are ways that those things can still creep in. So in some ways, it doesn't necessarily um, completely remove those biases. The fact that, that these reviews are taking place, um, I don't want to say in secret, but, but certainly um, not in the open, leads to problems of abuse and theft um, in terms of people using other, stealing other people's ideas before this thing gets, before something gets published because they were exposed to it um, through the review process or abusing um, their own sort of position as a reviewer to promote the paradigms of their own research and maybe um, stifle alternative paradigms when, when it comes to the research. Certainly there's problems of consistency. There's been studies done where the same paper from one one review to the next at the same journal may be accepted in, at one point. Three months later, it would be declined and then accepted again three months after that. Um, so there do there do appear to be problems of consistency in the in the review process. Part of that I think stems from what could be seen as a lack of sort of standardized training. Um, so. Some of, the, some of the things in the current state of peer review are addressing that training, and, and I'll point to some specific resources in that regard. Uh, with a lot of the preprint servers and a lot of the institutional repositories and the way that research is published now, it's actually quite easy if one's <laughs> interested in circumventing the blind aspect of the review. It's, it's not terribly difficult to figure out whose research might be in front of you if, if you, if you want to dig in and use Google to your advantage. Hopefully any ethical reviewer would kind of put that aside and maybe they might recognize it just for the type of research that it is. Um, very, sometimes there are very few people researching in a particular in a particular area, um, at least at the very granular level. So in, in a sense, even double blind review really isn't necessarily truly blind. Um, certainly one of the biggest issues I think, and, and the one that I think is most clearly addressed um, through through open peer review and open methods is accountability. Um, I mentioned the abuse and the theft and, and things like that, but the, the more open things are, when you're putting your name on something, you're going to be a little more cautious um, about, about the critiques that you make, and certainly be more careful in, in your comments and that sort of thing. Um, but also, people can take your own entrenched perspectives or your own biases as a reviewer into account um, when they're when they look at the review and when they look at whether or not you, you recognize this for publication so there's there's more that can be brought to the table for the average consumer the average reader um, by by tracking more of that process and, and making it available to them to make a fuller assessment of not only the work, but also the, the review and the editorial processes behind the final publication. Um, and the last one I've got is lack of recognition, which is really a labor question um, in terms of the limit, the limits of um, individuals' time and their willingness to take part in that process. Um, <clears throat> when, um, when we're looking at the when we look at open peer review, it really means a lot of different things. Um, one of the recent reviews, uh, sort of a sort of an overview, getting at a defin definition of what open peer review means, um, turned out to be something like a 50-page article. It was incredibly extensive, and, and not surprisingly, they found out that open in that context means lots of different things. Um, I think the given the double-blind standard, I think the the clearest version of of that that would come to anyone's mind in, in that discussion would be the unmasking of the names, um, either the author or the reviewer or both. Um, now, they can be unmasked to each other, unmasked in one direction where the author knows the reviewer, but the reviewer still doesn't know the author, or they can be unmasked publicly um, for the world to see and, and listed alongside the publication. And we'll see some good examples of that. Um, some some journals just publish the reviewer names, so you know who is responsible for the for the review, um, but you don't necessarily see anything but the finished product. Uh, 
so you'll know that they were involved in editing and giving feedback on that, uh, but you won't necessarily know what their feedback was or who, who made what decisions or anything like that. Um, many journals do some, some version of sharing reviews with the author. Typically, this is, I think, under the standard double-blind method, this is uh, sort of mediated by the editor. Um, so the journal editor might take the reviews from the, from the reviewers and sort of parse them out and, and convey them potentially in a different way, potentially just in a blinded uh, document to, to the author. Um, that's certainly one way that, that things are handled. And, and that one, I think, sort of sits on the edge because it's not terribly open, but the content is open. So the reviews themselves are opened up to the author. Um, so in that sense, it is, it is open. Um, publishing the reviews on the website, which um, I'll talk about a little bit more on a, on a later slide. Um, having those reviews published right alongside the final document, um, potentially even in line with, um, with each version of the document, you can really see um, how, that, how that document has been changed throughout the review process and see the reviews that have gone into it and potentially who those individuals are and just this just opens up a massive amount of transparency and I've got a couple of really good examples of that um, that I think are, are these journals are doing very interesting work in exploring these options. Um, open commentary is really more of the um, more like a <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, more like a YouTube, more like comments on YouTube, uh, where any individual from the wider public can can chime in. And there, while there are many aspects, many negative aspects to that, if you can um, do some form of valuation of that of that feedback, where the more helpful comments rise to the top, and the more useless comments rise to the Fall to the bottom, where hopefully no one ever has to read them ever. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's that's one version, and and there there are different um, platforms that enable different aspects of that. Um, but the most useful ones aren't really a free for all. Um, there's uh, controlled identity, so people know who it is that's making the comments. Those identities are verified, hopefully, um, and and are, again valued in a way that you know allows allows that commentary to be useful and not just a, a nasty string of Russian bots or something. <clears throat> so many, many different versions of open and each of them address in various various levels a lot of the critiques that we talked about. Um, to get into some of the specific critiques, I don't think this one quite made my list um, on the on the brief overview earlier. Um, but the peer review process takes a lot of time. Um, it isn't, it's not uncommon at all for the period from submission to public to final publication to be potentially greater than a year. Um, that's not uncommon. Um, six months is probably on the, on the fair fast side. And then you know, three months is, is actually cranking it through. So um, there is a massive delay, not only, not only in the time and the labor that goes into the reviews and, and that, that editorial process, which is important. We don't, we don't want to short circuit the benefits, the important things about that. Um, but these delays do slow the availability of, of very important research. Um, I think right now, um, in the time of COVID, I think we're very aware of that. And, and people are looking um, for better or for worse at, at the at preprints because they are showing, because those are making the most recent cutting edge research available. Um, but unfortunately, without significant peer review in place to, to screen those in, in ways that we might like. Um, another thing on the, on the access and, and um, this, this sort of ties in with the access delays, which is why I've got it here. Um, if, if someone submits a manuscript and it gets, it gets reviewed by the editors and rejected, gets sent to another, um, another journal and rejected from that one, at each stage of this, there's at least some cursory level of review happening. Um, but that's complete. All of that labor, all of that effort is completely lost in a double blind process. Um, if that, if those reviews and those comments aren't being recorded and 
made available either to the author or to the, to the public in some cases, uh, you're, there's a lot of labor being duplicated, um, wasted, just tossed into the waste bin because no one ever, no one ever sees it, no one ever benefits from it, except for the, the gatekeeping process at, at a particular journal. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can enable those reviews to be seen and to track those reviews at, at every stage, um, say, seeing the potential for seeing the rejection history of a manuscript so you can use those rejection notices if those were open. I'm not sure how many authors would want to have a list of their rejection notices posted for the public, but um, but you can see that there would be value in that, in that every every comment in that regard could, could be brought toward screening, toward um, education and, and refinement of a manuscript also. I mentioned the inconsistency earlier. Um, this is one study that was done a long time ago and there's been many, many, many done since then, but this was one of the early ones um, where they were assessing peer review practices in psychological journals and um, this was, these were articles that had specific methodological flaws um, sort of baked into the papers. They were submitted across the board to a range of psychological journals and um, of the ones that were accepted, they resubmitted those to the same journals, to the same, you know, uh, across the board. And so acceptance, and, and then they were, they were not accepted 38 months later. And um, Granted, that's a significant amount of time, but the rejections were not for timeliness. They were for methodological flaws. So even the ones that were accepted were declined um, 38 months later. So there, there was definite, they were definitely um, showing a significant inconsistency at journals in terms of um, their editorial practices. Um, they, might, they might go through the, the review process. They might go through editorial screening, but those screenings weren't necessarily... Um, quite as systematic and quite as um, accurate and consistent as, as we would like. So um, those inconsistencies are, are a problem for, um, for peer-reviewed published research. We, in any way that we could um, make that system more objective, I think would be a benefit. Um, and by publishing open reviews, that, 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 some of that problem can be met. Um, because you have people chiming in, they'll point out previous problems, um, those, those acceptances, rejections, commentary are documented, and they're to be referred to um, on future evaluations of a manuscript. So that, that's an important aspect. Um, when we think of the double-blind process, we tend to sort of um, idealize it in terms of if it makes it through, then everything's perfect. And if it doesn't, then it should never have been published. And, and the reality of that is really much grayer and even um, not think things that are, that maybe yes, maybe no later. So they're definitely inconsistent there as well. I talked about the accountability um, very briefly. So there's, there's lots, of, lots of things to be aware of in this regard. Um, many of these, many of them fall under bias as well, but um, any, any individual who takes part in any of the other problems that I mentioned on this list would easily fall into the accountability aspect too, because they're, they're not only exhibiting bias, they're being, there's no accountability for that bias. Uh, so there's all sorts of potential for un unethical action when things are done behind closed doors, and peer review is unfortunately no exception. Um, not only on the reviewer side, um, but also on the author side. There have been some pretty curious things recently um, with, the, with the online uh, aspect of, of review. Um, there, there are potential for reviewers. I think this is a little less common because of the mediation um, by editors and, and some um, commitment to some of the objectivity, but there are risks to... Uh, risks of subverting submitted research. So a uh, new document comes in that refutes the possibility of the constancy of the speed of light. 
and and it's rejected either through editorial action or through peer reviewer action um, that may or may not be you know sound research and worthy of, of, of viewing but they may sort of hobble that research and not let it come to light um, because it goes against the pair the sort of entrenched paradigms so that's a that's more of an aspect of, of bias but that that risk of subversion and the lack of accountability for that kind of subversion is a pretty big deal um, one of the more recent things that that, that has come up um, on the author side and and Kaplan uh, wrote about this in 2015 um, there there is a possibility and these things are being more clo more closely looked to but um, but continue to, to rear their heads once in a while of individuals occasionally when a paper is submitted individuals can submit a list of reviewers that that might be you know it's, if it's an obscure topic or a specialized field of individuals that might be qualified to review that work and Kaplan wrote about a number of um, tactics that were being used by authors to essentially submit fake reviewer names, um, say an email account that I open on Google in the name of Bob Smith, and then I, then I submit that Bob, Bob Smith be one of the people that reviews my, my article, um, and, those, and that those identities would be completely faked and run by the author, and of course the author is going to recommend um, that they publish the work. Um, so Springer, one of the largest, uh, one of the largest academic public academic research publishers in the world, um, had to re retract some 64 articles at within a very very narrow period of time um, because they they found out that these were reviewed under faked reviewer names. Um, so that blind process again, um, all sorts of problems of accountability. I've already talked about a number of the the biases. Um, gender, nationality, and language, I think we're very aware of prestige in terms of uh, if Francis Crick were the discoverer of DNA structure, one of them um, was, were to submit a paper and, you know, it's Francis Crick, so of course it's going to be published. Uh, there's there's certain certainly potential for that. Um, blind reviewing can, re can remove some of that, um, but there can, there can still be um, biases that, that creep through in that regard. Uh, confirmation and theoretical perspectives being entrenched, I kind of talked about. Uh, rejecting work that, that doesn't necessarily meet the paradigm of, um, of theory at, at any given point. Um, not necessarily unsound research, but just, just goes against the grain too much to make it through the process. Uh, and that's that's a real danger because that's essentially what what science and the scientific method is supposed to enable, and yet there's uh, the possibility of getting those entrenched perspectives um, systematically introducing bias into the screen of published research. Um, one last, well, two last uh, systematic biases. There there tends to be a strong um, bias in favor of um, new studies with new results, but no, with new new studies with new positive results, but no real um, favor for replication studies. So, if a study was done, it's important to know if it can be replicated. Um, but nobody really wants to publish the replication because it's already, in some sense, established. Um, so, those extensions and replications sometimes aren't necessarily given um, a venue to to really establish what the original um, positive results established and likewise with negative results um, there's a lot to be learned from negative results in studies but they tend that those studies tend not to have the flash and and the capture the headlines that, that positive results do so when, it, when we get to the labor question um, and having worked with a couple of journals now and working with the editorial staff and identifying peer reviewers um, there really is a labor shortage when it comes to peer reviewers and and journal editors and that sort of thing um, the system is is strongly overstressed and it relies on a very small pool of reviewers 
Um, you may be aware that you don't typically get paid. Um, maybe if you're a full-time journal editor uh, for a larger publisher, you might have a paid position, but um, typically the editorial work, the peer review work is all done voluntarily. Maybe meeting some um, version of a service requirement for tenure or something like that, um, but even that can be quite vague when it comes to the, the recognition or incentive for participation in peer review. Um, because it's done anonymously, you're not getting very often that formal recognition um, and certainly no, no compensation directly. Um, the, all that, the only compensation is really uh, secondary to any promotion or recognition that you get in, in your professional work, um, which really comes sort of alongside of that, that rather than recognition for participation in peer review. Um, so that those things really boil down to there's not a lot of motivation for individuals to take part in the peer review process. Um, and I'll show some examples in, in a minute here um, about how recognition, um, how, how we can enable recognition and uh, verify participation both for faculty performance review and um, prestige if individuals are, are strong peer reviewers and that kind of thing. So, um, and, and by enabling a system that does recognize and provide incentive, then we're broadening out that pool of reviewers. Uh, and that has benefits in itself, not just in, ju not just in the effect on the pool of labor, um, but in the perspectives then that are brought to the peer review process in terms of a wider pool of reviewers means a wider um, diversity of perspective coming to bear on the review process. I mentioned this briefly in terms of the rejection, um, the multiple rejections of a journal earlier, um, but those reviewer comments at whatever stage, whether they're coming from um, the cursory glance from the editors or um, peer-reviewed comments that then end up rejecting a paper, that's still very useful knowledge in not only to the, the author, um, but from an educational standpoint, from a peer, a peer reviewer training standpoint, um, providing exemplars of what those comments look like and how particular papers are dissected. Um, so there, the, the waste, the, the idea of those comments or that, that labor, that effort going to waste um, is, a, is motivation to provide other avenues where, whereby those efforts are not wasted and that, that, that they do provide, um, they are able to um, convey fruitful information to the readers, to the, to the authors. Um, and I mentioned already this, the comments and that discussion that takes part throughout the peer review process can guide um, the training of, of the next generation of reviewers as they come into their professional positions. <clears throat> Just to look a little bit closer at the review process itself and the roles and the competencies um, that the reviewers are, are really looking to provide um, there, and this kind of ties in what we said earlier with the essential processes of, of the peer review process, we're really looking at what gets selected for publication, um, right? That's the, that's the gatekeeper role. Um, but in, in the current environment with preprint repositories and institutional archives and working papers, there, there's much more of that information being made available um, in the early stages, whereas in previous years prior to, you know, before the internet, um, those things might be made available at conferences or published through conference proceedings or something like that, um, that were maybe, maybe achieved some level of peer review to get into the conference, right, being screened for acceptance for presentation. Um, but with the internet now, it's the, the ability to publish that information, that is make that information public, uh, has really broadened and and things can be made public very, very early in the process. So in a sense, the selection for publication almost doesn't make sense because we're not selecting what makes it into 
um, what what makes it what qualifies it to be put in front of the reader um, because now what qualifies it to be put in front of the reader is an internet connection um, so we're looking for looking more toward the evaluation of that and the provision of that feedback and that, that commentary to evaluate the reliability and validity and to improve the communication of the work. Um, so in a sense, um, the idea, if you're limiting this to what, what warrants publication, I think we're in a very different environment and, and what publication is means something very different than it used to. Um, and we need to find ways that that continue to meet the evaluation, the gatekeeper, the um, sort of ranking of importance of work um, in an, in an internet enabled world. <clears throat> and open open peer review does have the potential to um, improve those role, improve the, those functions of those roles in a more open environment. Um, but because of because of the ability to provide that, because of the ubiquity of internet connections and the ability to comment um, widely uh, as, you're, as you're perusing your research, um, that opens up opportunities for, for new, other new and useful functions um, of the reviewer in that new publication environment. And that's what we're kind of getting at when we're, when we're looking at open review. So um, I'll stop for just a second and then um, quick break if anybody has any questions. Um, moving along a lot of information so okay with with those critiques in mind um, let's just kind of revisit the various varieties of open um, of open review that that exist and talk about how they how they meet um, some of those some of those criticisms that, that we addressed earlier so <clears throat> Van Royen did a pretty Pretty famous study in two that published in 2010, um, where they were looking closely at um, what what were in the reviews, what were uh, how the, how blinding versus not blinding affected methodological issues in papers, and they weren't necessarily um, looking close looking as closely at some of the biases and, and other things that we were we were looking at, um, but by giving the giving their reviewers the a choice to or uh, assigning them to a, a a choice of whether or not their um, identity would be revealed, Van Royen, at least in their study, found that there was there was no effect on on the detection of errors. People were not um, looking any any more closely if their name was going to be revealed. They weren't well. They weren't more able, like more carefully detecting these errors. They, it's pretty much the same rate, um, whether they were blinded or not. So um, the idea of it in here in instilling some sort of accountability is kind of argued against there. But the idea that you would want necessarily to kind of hide behind your identity, there's some so social theories that um, think that by opening up peer review, um, individuals aren't, aren't going to be as open or um, as careful or that, that they'll somehow be more careful or more reserved in their feedback. And, and that was, was certainly belied uh, by the data that, that Ben Royan found. So um, the, given the open identities, just unscreening the names so that people know whose who's work they're looking at or whose um, who it is that's reviewing their research. One, it, it incentivizes peer review participation because now my name's out there. They know that I review my, my superiors, my department know that I review um, for this particular journal. I might even be known as a stellar reviewer um, in one way or another. Certainly by exposing your identity, you're exposing any conf conflicts of interest that might sort of through malice or not, um, creep into your your evaluation of a work if it's if it's going against your own data, or you have um, some potential financial interest that that is not disclosed uh, by attaching your name to it. 
it sort of sets a paper trail where people can can look and see. You know, this person rejected this paper. It seems pretty sound to me. Why why else might he reject it? Oh, he works for Pfizer or something. Um, so those conflicts of interests are are very clearly exposed, and I think that's one of the places that um, open review can make the most inroads is is really um, providing that accountability. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the idea that it, it increases objectivity. The Van Royen study doesn't really doesn't really get at that, um, but there there is some indication that when you attach your name to something, you are more cautious. Whether that's in how carefully you heard your review or how care, how closely you read the paper and and give really really attentive feedback. Um, there do seem there hasn't been a lot of work on that, but there do seem to be some indications that that, that the objectivity can be improved um, by attaching your name to it, because you don't want to write a sloppy review if everybody's going to know that that's your review. Uh, and again, down to accountability there. So open identities just by just by unscreening the names of the authors or the names of the reviewers can actually address a lot of those concerns that we talked about. Again. You know, uh, certainly there's a potential for additional problems to arise from that. Um, so some of the bias, some of the bias that we're removing can be re not reintroduced, but different biases are introduced under um, open peer review in terms of seeing the name and knowing who that individual is. Um, but the, the idea, at least behind supporters of open, open review and open reports, oops, I'm on open identities still. Um, at least the the idea behind the, the supporting idea behind that is that it will that the the benefits of that accountability outweigh the potential for the biases that might be introduced by opening up identities. Open reports is another one. Um, this is this is essentially instead of just the just the reviewers themselves having their names revealed, the reports themselves can either be shared or published alongside the final article. Um, I have some good examples of this toward the end of the, of the presentation. Um, the reviews may still be blinded or they may be open identity. Um, they, can be, they can be published as you know, blank documents with no identifying information, um, or they can be shared very widely versus, versus published alongside the article. Um, I, I talked about that um, the, the, the value of the conversation in the peer review process and seeing that within the <clears throat> seeing that within the, the context of the conversation itself um, can provide valuable information and that that topic comes up again and again um, and it, it basically enables the reader not only to sort of see other people's perspectives on the article but to process those arguments in more in more detail through the creative disagreements um, that and and discussions that take place in in the conversations throughout the review process, and that itself um, can can lead to greater thoroughness. Um, and those reviews again can be used as instructional aids for evaluating research, um, whether that's in um, coursework on consuming research or in um, training for future editors and future peer reviewers again. Open participation. This is really the kind of crowdsourced YouTube version that I mentioned earlier. Um, the sort of crowdsourced peer review is really the one of the best ways to describe this. Um, the the better versions of this enable some sort of um, commenter identity, um, identity verification, um, ORCID ID, and Publons researcher ID are ways that kind of enable um, you to have a verified identity um, and hopefully not be masking um, submitting reviews under some shadow name, uh, shadow pseudonym, or something like that. But the benefits of, of the open participation are really in massively widening the pool of reviewers. And, you know, maybe there are some gatekeeping bars in, in terms of who can be allowed to review 
or maybe it's completely open and anyone who has an internet connection and can see the paper can comment. Um, but the point is to get those diverse perspectives, which would reduce theoretical entrenchment like we talked about and bring more knowledge um, to the process of peer review. Most, most peer reviews don't usually have more than two, maybe three reviewers taking a look at the manuscript before the decision's made. Um, if you've got at least potentially, you know, hundreds or thousands or uh, individuals potentially commenting on this, there's much more knowledge being brought to bear on, on the um, evaluation of the argument, the, um, the completeness of any um, data or literature review that might be, might be, that might have left something out. Um, if you've got enough people commenting on it, um, they'll bring all of that information into that conversation. And that, that from a, from a scholarly communication standpoint, is, can be very, very valuable. The problem, obviously, is how do we control who, who, makes, who makes the comments or how those comments are presented. And um, I think Amazon, Amazon, there's some discussion about doing, doing this through something like Amazon's reviews. Uh, where Amazon's reviews have, you know, they've got the five-star review, but people can rate, rate it as particularly helpful or not. And um, by rating these reviews as particularly helpful or as particularly thorough or as particularly accurate, um, we can envision a way where somebody, where the, the entire world can comment, like on a YouTube page, but those, but those comments are, are ranked in some way by their usefulness, their thoroughness, their accuracy. Uh, and the and the the flaming tirades just sort of fall to the bottom of that list, and nobody ever has to see them. Um, <clears throat> that itself introduces additional problems in terms of what that algorithm looks like. Um, but I but I do think it's a an ar an argument or a discussion worth having about how we might enable that in the best possible way uh, to get that wider that wider perspective of, of reviewer types. Manuscripts themselves, again, I'll have some examples um, of this, but uh, in addition to the potentially publishing the reviewer comments alongside the manuscript, the versioning throughout the process can take place. So at this point, we're getting at essentially making the entire review process transparent. Um, manuscript gets submitted, that's made public. Manuscript gets accepted or rejected, that letter is made public. Uh, version two is submitted, manuscripts accepted, both of those, the version and the letter are made public. Uh, the reviewer comments are published right alongside that. Um, and then the final version. And at any, at any point from the final version, there's the potential to link to see comments on version two, original, um, original decision uh, processes and, and that, that kind of thing. Um, getting all of that feedback incorporated throughout the review process with all of the different versions of the articles so that you can literally go through and say, oh, okay, version one had a methodological error. They changed, you know, they, they changed their methodology, resubmitted, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and you can track the entire change of that. And when you're thinking about assessing the reliability of research, seeing that entire process, I think it can be clearly seen that that provides something of tremendous value that a double-blind review process does not. Uh, so the open manuscripts and, and open reviews and, and linking those all together um, is really, can prove, I mean, certainly open to criticisms of its own, but can provide, um, provide a very valuable service that double-blind double review never could. So one of the people, not people, organizations responsible for really pushing um, recognition and training for peer review is PubLons. And if you're not familiar with them, um, I'd encourage you to check them out. They, they're one of the organizations out there that allows you to have a scholarly profile, which will, and of course, um, which will uh, track your scholarly um, your scholarly publication profile, your peer review participation, 
um, PubLon's peer reviewer items actually uh, track your track reviewer ratings. If you if you review for a journal, there's a potential for that journal to there's potential for that journal to rate your um, rate your feedback, and and then that can be listed on your profile as well. So, just want to get in and show you what that looks like really quick. I don't like this because it always blocks my my tabs when I'm doing this. So this is just publons.org, and you can sign in and create an account. Sorry, maybe it's publons.com. There we go. Um, so this is this is my public profile. Um, you can see um, where I've the journals that I have peer reviewed for um, lists the journals that I've taken part with, um, but also also lists um, if you achieve you know excellent feedback from from your from the editors in a journal, then they can list that. Uh, they'll give you that reviewer rating um, on there. And the, the, no one's required to take part in that, and it'll only show up if it's you know positive. They don't they're not doing negative um, comments at this point. Um, but you can see that if this if I wanted to present this to my um, department for tenure promotion whatsoever, um, I can document my participation in the in the review process, and 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 that provides um, some level of. Uh, verification of, of me as a scholar and um, individuals reaching out or looking for someone to review um, have that that information to take into account when making their decision to bring me on as a reviewer um, so their publons provides that benefit they also have what's called a publons Academy and this is more getting more at the training so it's a a 10 module, at least at this point, it's a 10 module um, a sort of lesson plan where they go through and teach various aspects of peer review. The point being to standardize, um, standardize and, and um, train individuals in a, in a consistent way so that um, a lot of people as young professionals might be thrown into the peer review process, but nobody very few people ever take a course in what it is to, to be a peer reviewer. And that's essentially what, what PubLons is providing there is, is that something like um, a standardized course for, be, for becoming a peer reviewer. And I actually um, work with students at the university to publish a, a student-led journal um, publishing student research. And I, I require all my peer reviewers and all of my editors to have completed this course in order to participate. So um, we're addressing that that education, training, standardization aspect as well. So last thing, I want to show a couple of good examples of um, how Open Peer Review is being incorporated. Um, before I jump into that, any questions on here? Not necessarily question-provoking material, I don't think, but um, I'm yeah. open to Sure, jump in. I have a question. Um, so I'm actually completing the Publons Academy right now. So mm -hmm. I'm an OT student and oh, okay. um, I'm trying to become a peer reviewer for that student journal. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any advice in general. It's all pretty new to me, so. Oh, okay. Um, I think the peer review, I think the, the peer review academy, um, it, as you work your way through there, um, that, that goes a long way. Um, mm -hmm. The Anything that you've done with critical appraisals and, and things like that, um, right. assessing levels of evidence, assessing um, organization and argument, things like that, that th those are all going to be key parts. Um, the Publons Academy does focus on some kind of excellent core concepts that really need to be evaluated. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll actually be working with you at one point. You must have been in contact with Natalie and Kelsey. Uh, but but yeah, I'll, I'm sure we'll we'll meet um, closely at some point, and and we can certainly talk about that in more detail then. Um, but I can get you some other information offline if you like. Um, we're not particularly engaging in open peer review, but but thinking about the problems of peer review, 
I, I wouldn't mind if we if we pushed some pushed the envelope in terms of what we did with that journal um, into this zone to some extent. Um, I, I kind of like the the ideas and the the motivations behind some of these things, um, and, and sort of exempt, seeing exemplars like we've got here. Um, and that might, that might be another thing to recommend um, is to to trace through some of these. Um, you you may have been paired up with a mentor to to complete the Publons Academy that would give you feedback on on the information that you're incorporating into your reviews. Uh, but by reading through some of the published reviews um, mm -hmm. in individual, like I said, opening up that process and using that as a training ground. Um, and I'll I'll have a few good examples for you here that I think would be worth looking at. And looking through the reviews that that appear in there would also be helpful. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, this is this is PLOS Medicine. PLOS is the Public Library of Science. Um, they started as a completely open journal. Um, PLOS One was the initial version of that, and they accepted anything that anyone submitted, and then they relied on reviews and citations to to sift out um, the cream from the chaff in terms of that research. Um, Plus Medicine is obviously uh, a medical journal published within the Public Library of Science, and they they're one of the ones that are are utilizing an open a more open peer review process. So this is just the um, article page for um, the actually this was the the article that was at the head of um, the the on the highlighted article on the home page, and I just opened that one up and it had what I what I wanted. So um, this is where you would view. You know, you could download the PDF of the article from here. Um, you can view the author's information, check out citation information if you want. Um, but we can get at the peer review side by, by clicking on this. And then you can see um, going back in time, no, going forward in time on this one, um, the original submission, the decision letter. So this is the decision letter from the editor, and they're publishing that. So you can, you can view. Um, what the what the feedback was from from the editor on the initial submission, um, and then when we get down into revisions, you can actually view the author's response to um, looks like that second or that first decision letter on the first revision, um, and you can go in and view you know exactly what the author communicated um, communicated to the to the editor, um, and down to the final the final decision letter um, where they say we're pleased to announce that we're going to accept it. Um, that's just one way to do it. Um, this is fairly standard in terms of um, I think this incorporates a little bit more than than some others. Um, although I'm not seeing as much of the feedback uh, from the reviewers published alongside this. Um, some of those appear in some other journals. So this is the British Medical Journal. Um, their BM, BMJ Open also does peer, also um, tracks their peer reviews. And where did I find that article info? There we go. And you got to scroll down quite a ways, but you can see the publication history when it was received, when it was published, and um, view previous versions of the article. So each successive submission um, undergoing and. Un undergoing those rewrites and those those adjustments from the peer review process. You can also view the review history. Um, and here we have published comments from particular reviewers um, actually identifying the reviewer. So you can investigate, you know, does this person have any ulterior motives for rejecting the paper? And then see exactly what their comments are. Um, so reading through a paper and looking at those comments um, can be very educational. Um, it can also be very useful in evaluating um, the research itself within a broader context um, by taking into account all of the comments and all of the stages of that work. Um, I, I would argue that by tracking a paper through this entire process, um, you're, you're going to come, by the time it meets all these hurdles, you'll not only have a, more, a much more critical understanding of that paper, but also an appreciation of <clears throat> of where where it's particularly grounded and where it might not be by having worked through all those comments. Um, that is additional work on the part of the reader if they want to do that. But but to provide it, I think, is a valuable service. 
Um, the last one I want to show, because I'm running short on time, is F1000. Um, this is another mega journal that publishes on all sorts of topics, um, but, they, but they're as transparent as anyone that I've seen, and I quite like their, their interface also. Um, so they incorporate what's called Crossmark. Um, we use that in our journals too. Um, this is essentially uh, an update tracker. So um, it basically queries the DOI, the digital object identifier for the article, and will tell you if there's any um, additional versions, a later version, um, any licensing information. So you can see um, the information on the author. Here's her ORCID ID, which is a scholarly identity profile. Um, any license information. Um, sometimes they'll list funding information in here also, um, enabling that, that level of transparency. Um, here's the links to referee comments and referee reports. And so all of that's tracked through Crossmark. Um, but then F1000 also does tracking of, of versioning of the articles. So over on the right-hand side, we've got the initial version, version two, and it looks like we're, we're on version two. Um, so we can see that version two was submitted, it's been read um, and, and, and looked at by different reviewers. Uh, looks like maybe there's not comments. Yep, we do have comments from reviewer one. There's comments from reviewer two who actually approved it for, for quote publication. You can see what I mean here by what, pub what publication means in this context because version one was already published, right? It, in, in the sense of made public, um, but it was not accepted or given that stamp of approval by, um, by the peer reviewers until, um, by peer reviewer one until version two. Um, looks like version two doesn't quite have the, the imprimatur of three, reviewer three or four either. Uh, but we can look at those, we can um, potentially see who those reviewers are this is Scott Walter at DePaul University. We can read his feedback um, if they're listing any any uh, competing interests, and then you know we could potentially investigate that and, and verify or disprove that as well. Um, but we're we're able to look into the black box a lot more under these under these uh, with with these functions enabled for the journals so i, I think it's a, a valuable service i think it's question i think it's very debatable in, and i'm not going to come down on the side of one is inherently better um but i think it's without question that open peer review is inherently better when it comes to transparency at least 